Hi everyone, welcome to Lecture 11C of Useful Genetics, where we're continuing our discussion of mitochondrial genes, and in particular now, mitochondrial mutations. We'll talk about the nature of mitochondrial mutations and the way that maternal inheritance works, a topic that we raised in Module 6. We'll talk about the problem of heteroplasmy and about new reproductive interventions that are letting parents who have mitochondrial diseases bear healthy children. We'll talk about ways to keep your mitochondria young and about some not very scientific um, claims that are being made in um, health food supplements. So when genes for mitochondrial functions are mutated, whether they're chromosomal genes or genes in the mitochondrial DNA, they cause a lot of problems. And that's because all of our cells need functioning mitochondria. This means that mitochondrial diseases are what are called multi-system disorders. It's not just one cell type that goes wrong. Many parts of the body are going wrong simultaneously. In particular, um, any organs or cell types that need really high amounts of energy are especially sensitive to mitochondrial mutations. This includes our brain and skeletal muscles. And because mutations in mitochondrial genes can cause a wide range of phenotypes, and mutations in different mitochondrial genes can cause very similar phenotypes because they're all acting by generally interfering with mitochondrial function. This means that disease names are not very helpful. Disease names have often been given based on a particular symptom or set of symptoms, but these can be caused by different genes, and so they're not very useful. Now, chromosomal mutations affecting mitochondrial genes, um, they're inherited just like other um, autosomal mutations. Um, we can use the same kinds of pedigree analysis with the proviso that Phenotypically, it may be a little harder to be sure that all of the phenotypic consequences are being caused by a single mutation. However, the situation is a lot more complicated when we're thinking about mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. This is partly because, as we said in Module 6, mitochondrial DNA is inherited only through the mother. Here's the reason why. Both eggs and sperm have mitochondria, but the sperm mitochondria serves only to function as power for a power source for sperm swimming. Um, only the sperm nucleus enters the egg. The sperm mitochondrion remains outside. Here's a um, ancestry diagram showing many parents and you, or any particular individual. And what I've annotated it here to show is that your mitochondrial DNA came to you from your mother, whether you're male or female. She got her mitochondrial DNA from her mother, who got it from her mother, who got it from her mother, who got it from her mother. Other mothers in your ancestry also passed on their mitochondrial DNA to their children, but because that was not the straight maternal lineage, it didn't come down to you. We can look at this diagram the other way up, thinking about transmission of mitochondrial DNA by a female ancestor. And again, we see that she has passed on her mitochondrial DNA to both of her daughters, and they have passed it on to all of their children, but only their female children have passed it on to the next generation, and only those female children have passed it on to the next generation again, where the female children have passed it on to their children, including you. So an idealized pedigree of a mitochondrial mutation with strictly maternal inheritance would look like this. We have the grandmother who has mutant mitochondria. She passes it on to all three of her children, and her daughters pass it on to all of their children. Her sons don't pass it on at all. However, this picture is complicated by another feature of mitochondrial mutations in mitochondrial DNA, and that's the problem of heteroplasmy. 
We know that complete loss of mitochondrial function is lethal. So any mutation that eliminates mitochondrial function cannot be inherited in all of the mitochondria. Instead, any person who survives to be born with a mitochondrial mutation has mitochondrial DNAs that are a mixture. Some of them have normal genotypes and some of them have mutant genotypes. And the proportions of the normal and mutant molecules in their mitochondria can vary widely. And this is why the severity of mitochondrial DNA phenotypes, mutant phenotypes, is very hard to predict. Now, here is some data from a family with a mitochondrial DNA mutation. Um, one person in generation one died of, was clearly affected by the mutation. Her only child appeared normal. Um, her normal appearing sister produced a son who was clearly affected by mitochondrial mutations. So the researchers analyzed the DNA of all the family members, analyzed the mitochondrial DNA to see how many of the molecules were mutant and how many were normal. And what they found was that there was enormous variation in the proportions of mutant mitochondria. Person one, the father on this side, had normal mitochondria, 24 were examined in two, they analyzed, for most of these people, they analyzed two different experiments. Um, however, the mother, who appeared normal, had in fact a substantial fraction of mutant mitochondria in her DNA, even though she appeared normal. Person three also had mitochondrial mutations, although actually fewer than this woman. And person five also had mutations. So all of these people had the mutations, but they were not detectably affected. Not all of them were detectably affected. This is an example of the phenomenon called penetrance that we described briefly in module five. Now, in the second generation, the first person was clearly affected, they had relatively small numbers of mitochondrial mutations. Their sisters, who were phenotypically apparently not normal or relatively normal, actually had higher numbers of my mutant mitochondria. And her child, again, had high numbers. Now, I'll show you um, the same sort of heteroplasmy data um, explicitly laid out in a couple of different pedigrees. Um, these are families with mitochondrial DNA mutations, and individuals in these families were analyzed for their blood, their hair, their urine, and their muscle tissue for the levels of mutant and normal mitochondrial DNA. And both of these women had low levels of mutant mitochondria, this woman had higher levels. She died at age 53. 40% of her mitochondria were mutant. Her son died at age 31. Again, 40% of the mitochondria were mutant. Um, both of these people suffered hearing loss. That's one of the phenotypes that can come from defective mitochondria. His sister also had high proportion of mitochondrial mutations, but she's still okay. In the second pedigree, what's particularly noteworthy is this woman who had very low levels of mito defective mitochondria and her son who died at age only seven months old with a mitochondrial di disease known as Lee syndrome and 90% of the mitochondria in his blood and 100% of the mitochondria in his muscle were defective. So the distribution of mitochondria between daughter cells is very hard to predict. Now, there are ways that genetic analysis can help now. Until recently, all that could be told to women who had mitochondrial mutations was, don't have any more children. There's nothing else we can do for you. But things are changing. And 
pre-implantation genetic no diagnosis has been quite helpful in some cases. You remember we discussed this in Lecture 6D, where a um, embryo is created by in vitro fertilization, and then once it's grown to, I think it's normally the eight cell stage, one cell is removed and its genotype is tested. Then only healthy embryos are actually implanted in the woman's uterus, so she only gives birth to healthy children. In principle, this can be done for mitochondrial DNA mutations too, but there's a couple of complications. One is that you can't produce embryos that are free of the mutation because there's so many mitochondria in an egg cell that always some of them are going to have the mutation. The best you can do is hope for um, embryos that have only small fractions of the mutant mitochondria. Here we're saying 70 to 85 percent normal mitochondria is usually the best you can hope for. The other problem is that because of heteroplasmy applying not just to the differences between different eggs that a woman has produced, but between different cells even within this eight cell embryo, um, measuring the degree of, hetero of um, defective mitochondria in one cell doesn't necessarily predict the proportion of defective mitochondria in the rest of the cells. Lately, there's another strategy that's received a lot of attention because it lends itself to being um, over-dramatized by the media. And the, it's often described as babies with three parents and considered to be quite a shocking gene um, intervention into natural reproduction. The strategy is to take the nucleus from the egg of a mother who has a mitochondrial mutation. So her, mit her egg contains a high fraction of mutant mitochondrial DNA. Researchers or clinicians extract her egg and then remove the nucleus from her egg and put it into another cell that's had its nucleus removed. And that cell comes from a donor who has normal mitochondrial DNA, no family history of mitochondrial mutations. So now this nucleus, circled in blue, is now in this mitochond in this ovum. And this is actually a photograph, a micrograph, of a normal ovum with all of the mitochondria stained with green fluorescence. That's how many mitochondria there are in a normal egg. And then that hybrid egg cell can be fertilized with sperm from the father. The result is a baby that has all of its chromosomal genes from the people who are going to act as its mother and father, but its mitochondrial DNA comes from the donor. Now, this is considered quite controversial, and there was a United Kingdom commission to investigate whether this should be allowed or not. And the ruling was very sensible. They said, as long as it's safe enough to offer in a treatment setting, then the ethical concerns, people were saying, oh, but it's not natural, but something awful could come of it. We don't know. No one's ever done this. But the um, commission said that these ethical concerns were outweighed by the arguments in favor of permitting this for people who could not otherwise have any children at all. And they said, well, there's ethical issues on this side, but there's also ethical issues on the other side. Is it ethical to deny people with mitochondrial mutations the ability to have healthy children? And this commission said, no, it's not ethical. We should go ahead with this. Now, even if you have healthy mitochondria, they're going to accumulate mutations in your lifetime, um, especially because the mitochondrion is not a very safe place to keep DNA molecules. It's very high energy metabolism, means that there's a lot of chemical free radicals and a lot of DNA damage going on. So I'm going to tell you about a study that indicates there's a way to help keep your mitochondria healthy. These researchers started with mice 
that carried a mutation in a chromosomal gene, but the mutation affected the reproduction of mitochondrial DNA. They, they made, because of a chromosomal mutation, they made a defective mitochondrial DNA polymerase. And when that DNA polymerase replicated the mitochondrial DNA, it made lots of mutations. What the researchers did, though, was they split these mutant mice into two groups. One group just lived the normal mouse-in-a-cage lifestyle. They didn't really get any exercise unless they really felt like it. The other mice were forced to undergo a lot of exercise. There are little mice treadmills, although they don't look like this. Um, and these mice had to exercise three times a week for 45 minutes on a treadmill, where they had to run really fast. Here's the results. This is the mouse that was not forced to exercise. And the mitochondrial mutation caused it to, to age prematurely. And you can see how old it is. Its eyes are bleary. It can hardly stand up. Its fur is going gray and falling out in patches. Its back is hunched. It's really unwell. Here's another mouse, same genotype, same mutation. This mice, mouse had to run on the treadmill three days a week. Its coat is shiny, its eyes are bright, it looks frisky and ready to go. So the take-home message is get lots of exercise. It's good for your mitochondria. Finally, you may be told about a lot of other things that are good for mitochondria. There are lots of so-called health food comp companies, dietary supplement comp companies, that are very happy to sell you um, pills that supposedly are going to help out your mitochondria. I don't think any of it has been validated by good quality research. Um, and, and it's often really expensive, $149 for a mitochondrial renewal kit. I wouldn't buy any of it. None of this has been tested or properly evaluated. So we've considered how mitochondrial genes are inherited, and especially we thought about the fact that, that mutations in mitochondrial DNA are inherited maternally, and because there are so many mitochondria in the cell, there's a serious problem of heteroplasmy that makes it very difficult to predict the phenotypes of offspring. We talked about ways to prevent the birth of affected children, either by screening the embryos and only implanting embryos with the smallest number of defective mitochondrial DNA molecules, or by replacing the mother's defective cytoplasm with its defective mitochondria with the cytoplasm from a healthy donor. And we talked about the importance of getting some exercise to keep your mitochondria young and then keep yourself young as well. Coming up next, we've got another pair of lectures on a relatively advanced topic. We're going to talk about epigenetics and imprinting. I hope to see you there.